Hey everyone, higher running coach and Hoka and chorus athlete Sage Kande here with another training talk. Today we're going to talk about zone two training, all the buzz in the last couple years, especially if you follow this channel, you've known I've talked about this type of training for almost the last 15 years on this YouTube channel. We go way back on the playlist, aerobic base building, take your easy days easy. The idea of running more volume or more weekly mileage uh, at a mostly a, a lower intensity, lower heart rate values, easy conversational pace to build up your endurance slowly and progressively. So then you could add speed and intensity more later in a training cycle and improve. But it's really all about that consistency. And I don't wanna uh, keep repeating myself because I've done several talks on this zone two training, but I wanted to address some of the misconceptions I did uh, earlier last year talking about the heart rate data and the number one thing that I've seen, and I've seen this especially uh, with runners we've coached at higher running, but also consulting with people on Strava, even uh, with uh, Kavuzi, Michael Co. last month uh, doing a little session with him, looking at his, his creeping on Strava, looking at some heart rate data. It dawned on me that a lot of people, if you just rely, and this is, goes with any smartwatch brand, on a wrist strap or an optical strap, there's a lot of error. And a lot of people, unless you got you know a real VO2 max test in a lab and it was controlled very well, that's an important point, uh, you probably don't know your true 100% max heart rate. And that's a moving target, especially as you age. And there's a lot of genetic differences that would suggest that your max heart rate might be radically different than a peer the same age as you. And it might not fit any formula like 220 minus your age or any MOF method formula or any arbitrary numbers like that because it's very highly individualized. And so where your zones fall in terms of the heart rate spectrum, could vary, right? Me running at 130 beats per minute, it's fairly easy for me. It's not, not super, super easy. That could be super easy for someone else, right? Likewise, your max might be 180 beats per minute. Mine's only 174 probably. So uh, there could be huge differences there and it, it changes as you age, like I said. So that's the first note. The second note is we usually go by pace to determine what is truly easy, right? Uh, so if you're like Michael Kokobuzi, pretty fast, qualified for Boston, uh, running marathon majors across the world, ran a 2.56, great time, sub three hour marathon at Tokyo. You know, he's in his 40s, trains really consistently, uh, puts in the time and the work, definitely. 2.56, great performance. Uh, you know, that's sub seven minute per mile pace. I'll put that in kilometers there for an entire marathon, right? Uh, it's actually more like 648, 650. I'll put the pace there exactly. Um, but yeah, so it's sub 700 miles. His easy day pace then could easily be a minute and a half, let's say 90 seconds per mile slower than that. So we're looking at, you know, 830 per mile, maybe up to nine minutes per mile. Uh, I kind of was critical of him for saying, why are you jogging around at 9.45 to 10 minutes per mile pace? But, you know, that's okay to do on some social runs, uh, especially trail runs. You're going to be running a lot slower. Most people, the common mistake with newer runners especially is they run their easy days too hard. They try to force it, and that's where you get into trouble. And that's why zone two training is so beneficial. If we say, oh, you know, run 80% of your weekly mileage at uh, this low intensity, then only 20% is actual speed work and higher intensity. Another final metric that I've always preached is the talk test. Can you carry on a conversation easily if you were running with someone and you wanted to string together flowing sentences, not huffing and puffing? Uh, that's probably a relatively good barometer of what zone two might be. But if we go back to heart rate, and again, Creeping on Strava with Michael Coe, don't mean to pick on him. Kavuzi, uh, he's got a great YouTube channel, you should check it out. I'll link to it in the description below, as well as the consultation uh, we did that's hosted on his channel. It was more of like a podcast. But uh, looking at the heart rate data, I was like, you know, I'm not sure about some of these numbers, uh, but you really see it when you start adding intensity. And what the value that I've really seen is coming out with a strap. Uh, this is Coros, I'm sponsored by them, full disclaimer. This heart rate strap actually goes on your arm and it's quite accurate, I will say, much more accurate than any wrist strap. So, uh, you know, if you're looking for something, this is compatible with other smartwatches as well, not just Coros. So, 
Uh, I believe Kavuzi was using a Garmin, hush hush competitor there, uh, and I don't know what this deal was with this workout. Maybe he was using a chest strap and it got loose and it fell down. That sometimes happened. Maybe there's interference with static on your running shirt. Maybe uh, there's, uh, you know, it's not tight enough or it's too tight. Uh, it's not reading the blood flow, but this works really well uh, compared to the wrist. And this, I'd say the armband strap works as well as most heart rate straps uh, that I've experienced. And you know, there's still some margin of error, but you could always tell, and I'll show you how you could tell. Uh, and again, this is going off on a little tangent away from zone two training. We'll get back to that at the end of the talk. But looking at this workout, I had suggested maybe he try doing some faster 800 meter repeats, kilometer repeats, uh, as well as some faster tempos, because he's training now for a sub 125 half marathon. It's about 629 per mile pace. We'll put that in kilometer pace there. So that's your goal pace for half marathon. The idea is that you should be doing high intensity speed work at low six minute per mile pace. And if you're doing 800s, you should even go maybe sub six minute mile pace, right? It's getting into that 10K, 5K pace realm, which we call VO2 max. I'd call it zone five. Uh, so it's, it's you trying to lower the pace or speed up the pace of the true what we call lactate threshold, which for him should be around uh, 620 per mile pace because uh, if you can't hold that for 45 minutes to an hour in an all-out race, how are you going to hold 629s for a 124 half marathon, right? Um, so we're trying to work on that speed and efficiency, a lot of benefits with speed work. Again, touch on that later. He's doing a workout 8x800, a creeped on Strava. And it was a good example because he's actually very good at pacing himself. Uh, so very consistent paces. He's popping off sub three minute, 800 meters. So sub six minute mile pace, very consistent with that. You can see the velocity spikes, cadence spikes, all very good. Controlled rest break, very good for a VO2 max workout. Uh, but look at these heart rate data spikes. You got a total error on that first rep, right? The heart rate's way too low. It's obviously not gonna be in the 80s for him. Uh, he should be probably closer to one high 160s, 170 relative to what I've seen him do in other workouts and his max um, that I'm guessing on actually. But the shark fin spikes is what you want. And I only see a couple of those kind of in the middle there. Otherwise you see these jagged heart rate lines and the heart rate line is the red line there. Uh, that shows that there's probably a total error there, right? It's not, and you look on the last strap, you know, it's just dropping off. It either he was wearing a chest strap and it like fell down or he was just relying on a wrist optical strap and it totally tripped out. So that's bad data. That's just bad heart rate data. You can't go off the averages on that. Just looking at those lines, they're too jagged. Even on the cool down, uh, it shows this heart rate going up into the 150s. He's jogging a cool down, which should be a very easy pace for him, nine minute per mile pace and slower. So uh, that's just one example of how bad the heart rate data can be. And if you translate that to trying to stay in zone two on an easy run, it might be way off as well. So, you know, sometimes, you know, the data is, it lies. <laughs> Your heart rate data, you can't always, you don't want to always take it at face value and you don't always want to treat zone two, a low intensity running, uh, at it, you know, as a black and white thing. It's not all in or not. It's not necessarily all good or all bad, right? If you get out of the zones, it's okay. And an example of that final closing remarks of this talk is you could go out for an easy run and the first 10 minutes, you might be warming up the first mile, first couple kilometers, you might feel kind of bad. First 10 minutes you're warming up, you might be in zone one. You might be jogging very slowly. We see this with a lot of elite East African marathon runners, especially they'll start off, you know, maybe a walk a little, then you light jog very slow, very slow. But then, you know, after 10 minutes, you, you're warmed up, you start feeling good. And this is just an easy day. Uh, you get into zone two. Maybe you're sticking that for 30, 40 minutes. Maybe it's a great weather day outside. You've got a runner's high. You're feeling really good. You could even step that up to moderate. And in our higher running training plans, we'll have these days where we say, okay, you could do moderate, steady uh, type of run. Maybe you get close to zone three. Maybe it's an up-tempo zone. You don't want to get carried away because it's not a true high-quality workout. It's an easy day but there's nothing wrong with going a little faster sometimes and the thing and then you ease off of it though and then you have a next day where maybe it's a true recovery day and you you stay in zone two uh but the true benefit and i go back to this over and over is that it's not so much about you have to stay in this zone you're stuck to this heart rate range you're stuck to this pace range which is a very wide range for most people it could vary uh you know a minute per mile right 40 seconds a kilometer um, it, it's not a set pace because, you know, weather conditions and stuff like that. 
um, the final note on, on Kavuzi's workout there, you know, there could be heart rates variations like that if there was a massive headwind and he was running one direction and heart rate spikes because of the headwind, pace slows, and then there's a downhill with a tailwind and then, you know, the heart rate drops, but that doesn't appear to be the case in that workout. So just, you know, crunching the data on the heart rate values there. Um, you don't want to always be forcing your fitness too fast. And so the real danger and the, the reason why zone two is so important and works is mainly because of injury prevention, right? Uh, if you went out and ran steady and hard every single day and you were bulletproof to injury and you didn't get injured and you were mentally just in it and tough, you would get really, really fit really, really fast and it would be great. That's a way some pro runners have trained over the decades. Uh, the problem is when you're starting to strain every day, mentally it's taxing, it hurts every day, it's, it's, it's not enjoyable, but it also, the skeletal muscular stress, the impact force of running faster is usually a great injury risk, especially as you get fatigued, as the days build up, you're pushing faster than you should, zone three, zone four, on what should be an easy day, and then you start pushing up the distance or the time of your runs, the, the mileage, it's a recipe for burnout, it's a recipe for injury, and that's the reason, the main reason why we don't do it. Uh, well, the main reason we do it is so we could actually run longer and increase our volume and mileage, and that's the real thing that adds skeletal muscular strength with our muscles and tendons and, and bone density, but also the aerobic adaptations, uh, mitochondria development, powerhouse of the cell, blood flow, better musculature, better capillary bed density, I'm getting into that, but that, that's gonna improve your stamina, that's gonna improve your speed, that's gonna make it easier to run longer and faster without breathing as hard. Uh, so those are the real benefits. And again, this is nothing new. Uh, it's been, it's not, not something I invented, obviously. Uh, you go back decades and decades to Arthur Lear, to coaches like that. Uh, they've promoted this aerobic base building first. The general model of training plans is to start with lower intensity, lower mileage, build that progressively, and sprinkle in more race specific intensity as race day gets closer. But you know, there are a lot of benefits to high intensity speed training. That's a whole other talk. Check out my playlist, uh, marathon training, ultra marathons, 5K, 10K, you name it, any service, any distance. I've pretty much covered a lot of it, had some good race experiences at all distances. So thank you so much for supporting this YouTube channel. Again, Patreon really makes it possible. I know a lot of YouTubers in the running related space have released their financial data, like how much, they, how much money they made from the YouTube channel with this many subs. Uh, I thought about doing that. I will tell you I've made considerably less than the, some of the people I've seen, even though they have way less subs than I have. And part of that's, uh, you know, you get great videos with a lot of watch time and a lot of views, and you upload very consistently multiple times a week. That's what gets you paid. I don't necessarily do that, so I get paid quite a bit less, and I've, uh, my financial drop off has uh, kind of been embarrassing, but thank you for those dedicated followers and supporting this YouTube channel. Patreon really makes the difference. So thank you for all that support and thanks to tile sponsor Hoka. Sponsors like Koros, Camelback, uh, to name a few, Spring Energy. Keeping the dream alive here. I got updates training for the next Ultra Tarawera as well as some Schemo stuff. Really excited to get out. It's been snowing here, so getting up high altitude mountain training still. Uh, comment below with future training talk topics that you would like to hear about. And again, subscribe, like this video, check out our training plans at higherrunning.com. Coach Sandy and I sell training plans for any service, any distance. Thanks again, and stay tuned for more VO2 Max Productions.